Let me show you some more good medicine for kids. The female remedy was laudlin, which is morphine. And I do like this one for little children. <laughs> Cocaine and you have a little cough? Here's heroin. Uh, somebody would frown. Oh, I didn't show you this. Here are a couple examples of outlines. I almost forgot. And I think I might take some of there, but I want to give you a couple examples I thought were very good organization. And so here is very quick brainstorm. Does everyone see it? Quick brainstorm. Very good outline. Very good check mark. And then this is a simple thesis, but it's good. Has an X, addresses the question, a Y, it's about more capitalists. Which, so everything comes back to that new system of capitalism and the wage system and the predominance of machines. And then factory system, wage system, machine tools. The only problem I have with this, and it's not a big one, just a little more explanation in factory system, wage system, and machine tools. But one thing, everyone look at this. Just take out the to become capitalist. And so it has the American system is radically changed by the Industrial Revolution, by the factory system. That's what I got from a lot of people, and that's no why. Did you catch what I just did there? You take out to become a capitalist and just have a factory system and list out the three things in the blueprint. That is a weak thesis. It's not horrible. You still might get the point that it shows you're organized. But now you're on the edge. That's what you need. Something to tie together, tie the whole thing, be back to the capitalism and the industrial revolution. Here's another one. Good org. Good thesis. Change it by impacting ideas um, brought forth during this time. Impacting ideas, it's pretty vague. So it's not the strongest why, but it is a why, isn't it? There's something there. And then the three main points, transportation, family, religion. One more. Is this anybody in this class? I can't remember. I literally, on purpose, try, try to grab three without looking at the names. And I block the names out just so I check, you know, be like good ones, but just random. Here's one. And it's an outline, but A little vague in the uh, why, but it still takes some kind of position about the change over the time, and then a good thesis or a good blueprint. Some examples. I had very good ones in this class that I didn't choose. Didn't mean you know I did that on purpose to, to punish you. No, I thought there were good ones in here. I just didn't grab them. I thought they're a good job. So, cheese. Where did we get to? Because we're a little behind you. Did we get to this? Yeah, we just got. Did we get to the tariff of abomination? Did we, did we get to the tariff of abomination? Did we say that? This would hurt Adams, this higher tariff. By the way, what was it called where they, or who broke up the Missouri Compromise and allowed to get passed? What person? Clay. And what was it, the bargain between Clay and Adams called, called that by Jackson supporters? The corrupt part where Clay became what position? And what was Clay's program for for internal improvement, a bank, and tariff? The something system. The American system. And who's that? Yeah, John Quincy Adams, of course. Did I, did I talk about Rachel Adams at all? How about Rachel Jackson? No. Okay. So Rachel Jackson was when the, the ways that not the Whigs, but the opposition, those soon be called Whigs, attacked Jackson. And it had said, this is from one of their newspaper articles, presidents did not directly campaign themselves, campaign for themselves into the next century. On a convicted adulteress in Paramore, so basically trying to say that she seduces men, or, uh, or be allowed herself to be seduced by, by a fallen woman, husband be placed in the highest offices of this free and Christian land, accusing her of being an adulteress because her divorce decree was not signed by the judge when the Jacksons thought 
It was actually a couple days after she was married to Jackson and therefore had two husbands, technically. Even though the Jackson thought she was divorced. And so they basically said that, look what kind of people, this is a picture of them, a water couple, we're going to allow them to the White House. And here's the thing. They use class to attack it. And they don't care about Rachel Jackson. They're trying to say that people like Jackson and Jackson supporters are immoral. That people on the lower class, and I mean the vast majority of people, are immoral by their very nature. In fact, that's why they don't have money or power, because they're immoral. That's what they say. It's not because of other reason they just happen to be born to, or parents, or whatever it might be. It's because there's something immoral about them, and therefore immoral about Jackson, and immoral, immoral about the new democracy. That was their argument. And Jackson took it at that, and his supporters. They thought this would work to lots of Jackson supporters. This rallied them to Jackson. But it crushed Jackson, and really hurt Rachel. This direct attack on their life, uh, she never recovered. She died soon after the election. Jackson never forgave the people he thought murdered his wife. And even though Adams did not do this directly, it was his campaign, people supporting him. So of course he's going to hate Adams and all those who supported him. And don't get past this class issue. That is such a big deal. They're dumb. They're ignorant. They're not born correctly. They're from uh, they're ill-bred. We have candidates to this day use the term breed a lot. The current president has said that a lot. So with that, the election would turn out to be a massive victory for Jackson. And look at the popular vote. Remember the popular vote doesn't matter as much? Popular vote, the people in the states are voting for whom? Electors. Look at the difference in the number of people who voted. More people are voting, and more people have the right to vote. So even though Jackson would represent this, some of it's happening outside of him. And big victory. And you can see the strength of his campaign. The West and the South. For complex reasons. Don't think in terms of slavery yet. That's not the reason. And that's a ballot from Ohio in 1824. Yeah. Was Jackson the one that invaded Florida? Say it again. Was Jackson the one that invaded Florida? Yeah. And so here it is. These are the electors pledged to vote for Jackson. So just like who can vote in 2020? So this side of the room can't vote, which I think is only fair. Actually, that would be illegal. I could not. There can be no law that says you can't vote because you're on that side of the room. But, but you have no right to vote. Yeah, isn't that weird? we got a weird system. When we go vote for president, you guys get to watch. In 2020, we're voting for electors pledged, three electors. And who's Jackson's vice president? John C. Calhoun. And Calhoun, he was Adam's vice president. Isn't that weird? I mean, like, all of a sudden, Mike Pence decided to run with whoever the Democratic nominee is. No, there's absolutely no chance of that happening, but that's what it'd be like in a way. So with that, we're coming to Jacksonian democracy. And when we think of democracy, when Americans say democracy, they're using the definition that came out of this era. And here's a cartoon supporting Jackson, and he's defending the people, and that's the people's house, the executive mansion. Not yet called the White House, but it's just been rebuilt after the War of 1812, and from all the rabid dogs sick upon, who, are, who were sick upon the sick or suck, sick and <laughs> sick upon the people, sick. It's all wrong. What are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is you can't trust these dogs <laughs> because the wealthy sick them on the people. That's right, sick them upon the people. I'm all messed up. I'm tired. But these rabid dogs are being sent by the elite and the very wealthy, and Jackson's defending the people. And you also notice something else. What's this gnome-like thing on the dog? Did you notice that? There's another one, like, back here. These little 
devils or something. He kind of looks like John Quincy Adams. <laughs> Not quite totally salamander-like, but so you have you can have one choice for costumes for dress-up day of the week before Festivus break. Is there one more? For the rest of us. Anyone know what Festivus is? I will I show the documentary about Festivus. But you don't know? Oh. We have so much to learn. You can draw. Maybe I should dress up as a little gnome like I have dogs. I think I'm cool. But one thing outside of Jefferson's or Jackson's bound, he did not do this, but rode the wave of it. And you do have to get this down. They dropped property requirements. From between 1800 and 1830, more states began to say you did not need property. Here are the green states. To vote, you need property. Here, all that said was, and it's still a big deal, but you had to pay a tax, a poll tax. It did keep some people from voting, but they got rid of the property requirement, so more white men could vote. Ironically, the reason why, for example, women could vote, especially in the North, was because they had property. When they got rid of the property requirements, same time as the Industrial Revolution, that would be the excuse to not allow women to vote. There's no law, or federal law passed. These are all state laws. Also, voter turnout went up. Went up during this time. These, this is the percentage of eligible voters. So even though most states in 1824 still had some kind of property requirements, even if those relatively few voters who could vote, just over a quarter <coughs> did. But look by 1860. Now that is a very important election, so a lot of people came out. That's the election that Lincoln was elected. But 80% of eligible voters, it would go up to 90% by the end of the century. And the reason why so many eligible voters, this time mostly white men, but they came out and voted, was because they felt that their vote was what? Mattered. And that's what you gotta get down. Voters felt part of the system. They felt part of the system that they're voting for politicians that will make a difference and they care about their vote. They're part of a group that cares about it. After the Civil War, it'd be more like a club. Not necessarily, not necessarily was a good thing, but before, our vote matters. And which party, the new Democrats or the new Whigs, would encourage and wanted more people to vote? Yeah, the Democrats, it helped them. The Whigs tried everything they could to keep people from voting. And they lost, obviously, this time. But to this day, there are elements in society that want to keep people from voting. And in the 1990s, for example, in presidential elections, they got below 50% of eligible voters voted in the US, below 50% in presidential elections. And those are usually, usually have the highest turnout. That means there's a lot of people who really sincerely believe that their vote doesn't matter why they have tried. And that benefits people. In fact, today, without a doubt, the more people voting benefits which one of the two parties? Yeah, it helps Democrats. The more people who vote today, the Democratic Party overall does better. Not everywhere. But even in Montana, which is a fairly Republican state, with more voters, the Democrats are in. And so, to this day, you have a real issue about trying to get people to vote. There's one more thing about that. We had a weird election in 18, or 19, in 2016. <laughs> I think it was every, every 100 years. But in 2018, there was a record number of voters in the midterm election. Record number, over 50%. That's never happened since uh, the, until the turn of the last century in a midterm election. Heck, in, in 19, uh, or sorry, in 2014, less than a third voted in the midterm elections. So obviously more people are caring. And that's why, that's arguably why the Democrats had a record victory overall in 2018. So we'll see what's going to happen in 2020. I wouldn't be surprised if there's over 70% in 2020. Of course, you could have a very weird situation where you could have a Democrat winning by six or seven million votes and still lose the electoral college. 
course, Hillary Clinton won by well over three million. So we have an electoral college. That's what it's set up to do. One more thing I have to add. So there's a real movement in some states to keep people from voting. Now, and then, and then you want to, one of the big things they want to keep people from voting from places like Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or North Carolina, all over the South, college age. They want to keep college age people from voting. Is this now or right now? Right now. Right now. You know why? Yeah. If the, remember when I told you about higher voters for not who that helps, but also if you don't vote when you're 20, what are the odds are you going to vote when you're 30, or 40, or 50? If you keep 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 people from voting when they're young, there's a less chance they'll vote down the road. People who vote when they're 18 or 19 or 20, they usually are lifelong voters. If you're one of those people who say it doesn't matter, you will be one of those people who will be taken advantage of. Just telling you the way it is. That's not a that's not opinion. That's a truism. Does that the sky is blue? Or Kit Kats are the perfect food? It's true. And pretzel course. So with that, let's get to Jacksonian democracy. Because Jacksonian democracy is this concept that most Americans would say is democracy today. And Jackson. He didn't like pass the laws, but he represented it, he fought it, and he became the symbol of the opposition to democracy. Those who hated democracy focused their anger on Andrew Jackson. He represented helping the common man. Now you could argue not all his policies did help the common man, but that's not the point. So here, democracy in this new context is no longer what a real democracy is. It means that the people are sovereign. Sovereignty. The people have power. And how do they show that power? They said then by self-determination, we will decide, AKA the vote. And who wins the vote? Majority rule. And we look at democracy today, when people say the United States is a democracy, well, we're not a democracy, but we look at this Jacksonian definition that the people ultimately have power, we can vote the rulers, and ultimately the ideal is majority rule. Now, is that the way it is? No. Remember, the Constitution was written to not be a democracy. So that's why we have the situation where the majority does not rule, as we just mentioned in the presidency in 2016, or for that matter, who picks judges, which have a great amount of power. The president, that's not democratic, that's not this. And who picked senators until 1913? You remember, the people didn't. said this once before, some of you might remember, but not sure, right? State assemblies. State assemblies. Is that democracy? Right, <coughs> but it's very distant, isn't it? So we think that isn't exactly what we have, even according to that loose definition of democracy. Next, how did you do that? Who is sovereign? White men. Universal white male suffrage. So common man, regardless of birth, commoners have the same number of votes as somebody who is wealthy, and they all have this power, regardless of who your parents are, regardless of how much money you have. Now, of course, it's more complex than that, but that's the ideal. Now, not all the states did this. South Carolina had so many barriers between elected office and votes. They were basically an oligarchy of just a few people. But a lot of states would do this. By the Civil War, every state had universal white male suffrage. But we're kind of missing well over half the population, aren't we? Yeah. And there's every reason to say that that's depriving many people of their rights. But there's something else to understand. This was really radical. Wow, you're letting regular people vote and have a voice? Even elect one of them president, Jackson? But there's something else to this. Once you get people to believe that it's okay that all white men have power, all white men, once you accept that, it becomes significantly easier to say, well, what about people who aren't white? Maybe they should have power too. And then once you say that all men, then it becomes easier to believe, wait a minute, if all men, why not all people have power? And so it's a stepping stone, slow, far too slow than it should have been, 
to at least have all people with power. And so, yeah, it's well, yes, you're forgetting people, but don't forget how radical that was. And once you get that, then you can change ideas. Change doesn't happen by you start here and all of a sudden change the entire world. You got to go sometimes in steps. You got to convince people, push them. Next, this distrust of this cabal or group of elites they call the Eastern Establishment. And it was personified by, what's this? The what? Yeah, the Bank of the U.S. And see this monster? That's Jackson fighting off the bank. This group of elite that want to control all the power. An oligarchy of wealth and control. Which has been a thing that has been a crisis in the United States. Because there clearly was this group doing it. They want to control. Just as today. There's a group of very, very wealthy people that really do dominate politics. And so there's an element of this. And then Jackson would say he wanted what's called the spoils spoil system. Have you heard the saying, to the victor goes the spoils? That's in war. But Jackson is saying government jobs, a.k.a. patronage. Patronage is the giving of government jobs. Should go to Democrats. Why should it go to Democrats? Jackson is saying the will of the people was for the Democrats to govern. That's why they elected him. Therefore, Democrats should have government jobs. Why would I ever have somebody who supports Adams as Secretary of the Treasury? And so that was his logic. That is true democracy. By the way, if you didn't know what patronage was, but you just wrote down patronage, okay, but you might forget. Put something about government jobs so you don't forget. Put something down about that. Just so you don't forget, because we'll come back to patronage. And back in 1829, every single government job in the United States, so every federal government job from tax collector to secretary of war to postal carriers, every one of them could be fired by the president and replaced at that time. It's not like today. And so Jackson, wanted to put Democrats in key positions. He didn't get rid of any more than any other president. He just very openly said, I'm putting my political sports in because that's what the people want. That doesn't happen today. Government jobs after 1883, most jobs are professional. And you get the job by merit and passing a test. And if there's a new president or in a state level, a new governor, they don't replace all the jobs. Some, like higher level jobs, the president or the governor saw a lot of power. And we live in Montana. Did you know that? We live in the capital of Montana. So there's a lot of government jobs. My guess is you have parents that probably might have a government job, a lot of you. And that's why they weren't fired when they were the governor, because we're not a professional. Back then, it wasn't like that. This could also open corruption, but that was his idea. And another biggie. That was like a cabal of very wealthy elite and aristocrats who ran everything. And they almost turned to what we'd say in the 20th century through today, today like a conspiracy theory. But there's also an element of truth in that. And before this time, presidential candidates or even candidates for governor were chosen by the elite. A group of all the congressmen, let's say Republican congressmen, would get together in a group called a caucus, and they would pick somebody to run for president for them. And to Jackson and his supporters, that's undemocratic. We want more people. And they would switch to party conventions. Party conventions, not elites, will pick the nominees. Ironically, the Democrats talked about it, but it wasn't the Democratic Party that did a party convention first either in the states or the national level. It was a third party called the Anti-Mason Party. And this was a party that believed that the secret society of Masons were actually in a cabal to take over the country and run it for their own personal reasons. Six of the first seven presidents were Masons. And if you've ever heard of something called the Illuminati and this whole thing about the Illuminati taking over, all of those ideas came from the Anti-Masons. And the Masons did have a lot of influence, a lot of powerful men. 
uh, we're in it. We're in it. Not as many now, but still a relatively big organization. They are huge in Helen. There's a lot of Masonic buildings here. Masonic Temple, Masonic Library. Do you ever wonder why the Civic Center looks the way it does? Because it's an old Masonic Hall. And have you heard of the Shriners? They're Masons. And it's that secret group, it's secret membership, technically secret, secret, all kinds of rituals that nobody knew. And the idea was they're getting together the plot to take over the world. The anti Mason party would die out, but their legacy would exist for a long time for party conventions. Yeah? What are they keeping the nominees for? So, like the Republican, or not, sorry, the Democratic nominee or the Whig nominee for president. So who will run as the Democrat for president? Who will run as the Whig for governor or for the House of Representatives? That's the nominee. At states, some states would have this all the way up to the 1960s. But to this day, Republicans and Democrats have a party convention. And then the state convention will send delegates to the national convention. And then they, will, they used to choose. At the turn of the last century, states like Montana started changing how they chose state level. And then in 1972 was the last time the party conventions actually picked the presidential nominee. That doesn't happen anymore. Who picks? What process picks state level nominees for now the Democrats or the Republicans or for state level or the president? What's the process? Say it again. Primaries. Primaries. And Montana has a primary on the second Tuesday after the first Monday in June. Don't ask. That's just why they do it. They just do it that way. But on the primary, will anybody be able to vote the primary? June, I think it's like June 6th or June 7th, 2020. So you and I, the three of us, so the three of us will go in and vote. We actually get two ballots. And one is Republicans and one's Democrats. And so let's say you're, you're Republican. You vote for who you want the Republican nominee for president, Republican nominee for governor, and so on. And whoever wants that becomes the nominee to run against whoever wants the Democratic one. Before, it was a big deal to go to conventions. That's what all the Democrats are running for right now for president. They want to be the Democratic nominee. And that's why our governor's always in what state? Not in Montana. I will add to that something called a caucus, which is a little bit different. A caucus is, instead of voting on a ballot, Democrats literally or Republicans have to go to one spot, like you should do it like in a gym. You get all these people in, it could be thousands. And they basically do a little pitch and then they kind of divide up there on what candidate they want. So it's more of a personal way to pick it. It's more like a convention. Iowa has a caucus, they have the first one. And that's why all these candidates are running in are in Iowa. I think five of them are in Iowa right now, the Democrats. And if, if they're not there, they will soon be there. The first primary is a week later, and that's in New Hampshire. And that's why those two states have a disproportionate amount of power to pick who the presidential nominee is. Because remember when Montana's primary is in June? That's in end of February. The candidate for president will already probably be chosen before it gets to Montana. How, how, how is the order decided? Hmm? Why can't we just move already further out? They actually talked about it, but it's never happened. Of course, Montana wouldn't have that much power anyway. Right. But then you think about it, Iowa or New Hampshire, I mean, do they really represent the complex nature of the United States? No. Yes, Iowa is just a micro. No, of course not. It's ridiculous. And then California, they used to be in June, they moved theirs up to third. And whoever, whichever Democrat, if there's a good chance three leading Democrats, one of them will win all three states, and that will probably be the nominee for president. That's how they pick president. If you didn't know about the primary, it's now it's good to know. And that's why they're running. That's what they're doing. Okay, so let's get back to this then. Who were the Democrats? They called themselves a democracy, and they were the farmers, you know, immigrants, wage earners, a lot of Westerners, and people wanted separation of church and state. Who thought that this second great awakening and state religions, which they still had state religions then, these state religions might push them out. And immigrants were what religion? A lot of immigrants were Catholic. And the majority of the, of the existing population were Protestant. So that's what they were scared of. Jackson, who, Jackson was intensely against the, uh, 
um, any kind of church influence in the federal government. In fact, he insisted on mail being delivered on Sunday. And so a lot of his opponents would say that he's godless because of this. 30 years, that would not be a, um, the country would change, and now mail is banned on Sunday. So, back to the democracy. Who opposed them? Anti, they didn't quite have the name yet, but they're anti Jackson elites. And they just hated Jackson. At first, they called themselves Republicans, national Republicans, but we're not going to worry about that. And here is a cartoon. This is actually from the Civil War, but it's mocking the spoil system. And they're, what tied them all together, they hated the, the they hated democracy. They called it either the mob or the term for majority rule was king numbers. Whatever tyrant could sway the ignorant masses to vote for him could become the king. So they had this elitist attitude that you get somebody who uh, plays to their fears or something like that and will vote for him. King numbers. That's why they said that Jackson was a dangerous radical and a demagogue. Have you heard the term demagogue? I used it once in class here. I know we use a lot of terms. Demagogue means playing on people's fears. And they said Jackson was playing on people's fears of the new system. And they're like, the system's fine. We don't, we're not in a cabal. Of course, then they used demagoguery, it's called, by saying Jackson wanted to be a tyrant. Can anybody name a politician that doesn't use demagoguery? And the answer is no, nobody who uh, wins. Sorry, they all do. I guess the point is you have to know if you agree with what they're saying they fear. A couple of things real quick. They call the spoiled system not only corrupt, but it would encourage mediocre, dumb people to enter it. The cult of mediocrity. And they're a bunch of godless Democrats. That's where you've got a lot of the nativists who are anti-Catholic immigrants. But also Jack Jackson's godless. And this will go back, but, but a lot of churches, oh, I jumped the gun there. <laughs> so who made them up? Northern banker or northern capitalists, the new capitalists, the new bankers, and southern plantation owners. But some churches didn't like that democratic idea that we all have rights, because you might question either the charismatic preacher or the dogma of the church. There is a problem, though. Northern capitalists and southern plantation owners actually have different economic goals. The one thing that they have in common, I think you can probably guess, they hate democracy. This will blow the Whig Party apart. Southern plantation owners and northern capitalists did not agree. So when Jackson was elected president, these people thought that Jackson was going to destroy the country. Oh, all Whig means is opposition party. That's all it means. It's the traditional British opposition. It comes from a Scottish term. Now, it seemed to be confirmed all their fears at Jackson's inauguration. The mob showed up, as they said, all these people wandering around the brand new, the brand new executive mansion, soon to be called the White House. Here they are, uh, and they try to make it like this unruly mob. But as they saw, our person is like the president. And then, if you go through the back door, then it was the front door of the executive mansion, soon to be the White House. In there was a massive block of, and cheese, as we all know, represents democracy. If you do, do, if you do not like cheese, you are a tyrant. <clears throat> Why does cheese represent democracy? This is good. And, no, why this? Because everybody just cut out a hunk. <clears throat> it's not something that we serve as special for individuals. We all can have some. It's not like caviar or something about just becoming the food of the elite. Who likes caviar? Who's had caviar? You know what it is? Fish eggs. Fish eggs. It tastes like salt and squishy things. I don't want to think about this. But moving on. But look, look how much. And so this represented. Wait, wait, look, look. It's it. It's it. Where do you get cheese from? Milk and enzymes. You have to have the enzymes, because if you don't add the enzymes, it just becomes moldy milk, right? Where do you get the enzymes? Anyone know? The first cheese came from when they would store milk in 
the stomachs of cattle, goats, and sheep. That's where the enzymes come from. So, enjoy your cheddar. Do you like cheese? You have to get the enzymes from them. You like cheese? Then you leave it tomorrow. You like cheese? 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 How may I help you? I'm so tired of cow towels. Okay, so the the wheat water. This is good. Good here, good here. Good here. You have to explain it more. That that good essay organ found. So you this was good essay. You just um, needed more relations. You, you did in the way that it's done. Good job, Nate. Good job. Anyway, like next one, if you don't have relate, you know. I'm sorry, I mean, you look great, we drop a little bit, but now you know. So it's not that big of a deal. I thought it was good. What do we need to do? All right, everybody.